Hi, hey everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here again with another China History Podcast. Part 8 today, the exciting conclusion of our Cultural Revolution Overview. Right now I'm going to suggest you go give episode CHP 67 a second listen, because a lot of what went down in China as 1975 transitioned into 1976 was discussed in that Deng Xiaoping Part 5 episode. December 16, 1975, Kang Sheng succumbed to bladder cancer and other ailments. Although Kang was given a nice sending off, as you recall from CHP 10, they kicked him out of the party, took his ashes out of Ba Bao Shan, and the only things you ever hear, officially or unofficially, about Kang Sheng are of the negative nature. 23 days later, on January 8th, after years of physical suffering, Premier Zhou Enlai also succumbs to the same cancer that took the life of Kang Sheng. That's how the Year of the Dragon, 1976, started off. And 12 months later, when common Chinese and cadres and leaders who survived the past 10 years of turmoil, when they all got together, you know, with whoever they partied with on New Year's Eve, no matter who it was, both Lao Bai Xing and Ling Dao alike, they could all agree years like 1976 didn't happen too often. This was one for the history books. China in 1976 witnessed a chain of events that began with the passing of Premier Zhou Enlai and ended with the reemergence of Deng Xiaoping onto the scene after he had been purged a second time. The milestones of 1976 are well known. Zhou Enlai dies January 8th. Hua Guofeng takes over from the disgraced Deng Xiaoping. Then there's the April 5th Tiananmen incident. The Gang of Four pours scorn on Deng for provoking that event. He disappears for a year. Hua Guofeng becomes acting premier. May 11th, Mao has another heart attack, and this one pretty much puts him out of commission. June 26th, Mao has another heart attack. July 6th, Marshal Zhu De passes away. July 28th, the Tangshan earthquake. Then in September, Mao had another heart attack. And finally, just past midnight on September 9th, Mao dies. And at this moment of crisis, Wang Dongxing is given control of Mao's personal papers so that neither the Gang of Four nor the Old Guard could mess with them. Ye Jianying, Li Xiannian, Hua Guofeng, Wang Dongxing... They all start having secret talks, and in fact had already come to a common understanding about what to do with the matter of the Gang of Four. October 6th, Hua calls a standing committee meeting at 8 p.m. in the Huairan Hall in the Zhongnanhai compound. Within half an hour, as they all show up, one by one, Wang Hongwen, Zhang Chunqiao, and Yao Wenyuan are arrested and held by the party center. Then, Jiang Qing is taken at her Zhongnanhai residence. October 18th, Hua announces to the nation that the Gang of Four had been smashed. These four people, plus Chen Boda and many others, had worn out their welcome for quite a while, so their fall was quick and without much resistance. With the gang seemingly in disgrace, with no chance of an amazing comeback now that Mao wasn't around to protect them, everyone was able to breathe a collective and symbolic sigh of relief. Deng Xiaoping missed everything. He was still out of the picture. He was down in Guangzhou when the Mission Impossible went down in the Zhongnanhai compound. But Deng stood close by his phone and was briefed on the operation after they took Jiang Qing in her bedroom. Thanks to his loyal friends, Deng is back by December 1976. And although not officially back or in any position yet, he is allowed to read party documents again. January 6th, 1977, Deng is officially back, which predictably spelled the beginning of the end for Chairman Hua Guofeng. Well, a very large swath of the Chinese nation finally had had enough of the Gang of Four, and certainly enough of the whole cultural revolution. The buzz in the air from Dongbei to Xinan was that these past ten years had been the penultimate waste of time resources, and lives, with all the new attention, prestige, geopolitical dynamic that began to happen in 1971, 1972, with Nixon's visit, and the sweet victory for the PRC at the UN, 
all the other nations beating a path to China's door and many other new happenings, just made the whole cultural revolution take on a particularly foul odor. There were too many green pastures being dangled in front of China with all the sudden changes. And lest we forget, it was Chairman Mao, not Deng Xiaoping, who put China on this road that led to Gaike Kaifang. Well, not so much the Gaike reform, but definitely the Kaifang, opening up to the world in general, and the West in particular. Mao Zedong gets splashed with a lot of mud from the Cultural Revolution, but let's give him credit for being so bold as to see the benefits to rapprochement with the USA and the other Western former imperialist powers, and to allow that to start happening only five years into the Cultural Revolution. So, if there was any wind in the sails of the Gang of Four and their minions, it was a foul wind indeed. From my research, it seemed it didn't take too much talking for Li Xianian and Ye Jianying to convince Hua Guofeng into siding with them. Although, as long as Deng Xiaoping was still alive, that posed a potential threat to Hua. But in October 1976, Deng was out of the picture. So Hua's immediate threat was the Gang of Four. Wang Dongxing, too. He came over to the side of the anti-Gang of Four. I cannot stress how important this was to have had Wang Dongxing on their side. He was very tight with Jiang Qing and owed all of his power and authority to her good graces. He could have just as easily sided with Jiang Qing, and that would have thrown a wrench in the plan. Now came redemption time for Wang Dongxing. So on October 6th, 1976, when the Gang of Four were taken under the direct control of the party center, there weren't too many out there who were jumping to their defense. In no way am I saying they had no friends, but they had no friends that mattered. Of course, there were still die-hard radicals around China who still supported them and fought for them, but overwhelmingly, the tide of history was going against the Gang of Four. So what of the Cultural Revolution? What to do about it now? The gang was overthrown. Mao was gone. Hua was doing a good job so far, handling Mao's funeral arrangements and dealing with the gang. The next order of business was to bring Deng Xiaoping back, but that could wait indefinitely as far as Hua Guofeng was concerned. But Hua's 15 minutes were going to be up real soon. In the glorious afterglow of the end of the Cultural Revolution when Hua Guofeng said in February 1977, quote, Whatever policy Chairman Mao decided upon, we shall resolutely defend. Whatever directives Chairman Mao issued, we shall steadfastly obey. The two whatevers, ladies and gentlemen. And when Hua Guofeng went a little overboard about not wanting to trash the Cultural Revolution and saying, you know, there may be more to come one day, his 15 minutes were up. But for all intents and purposes, with Mao Zedong gone from this earth and the Gang of Four already taken into custody in October 1976, the Cultural Revolution was finished. It had done its damage, and all that remained was a good old major industrial mopping up. And that was the next step to all of this. They had to do it after the Great Leap Forward. Now it was time to do it again in the wake of the social political and economic destruction wrought by the Cultural Revolution. But before this could be officially carried out, there was one last step, and that was to bring Deng Xiaoping back and put him into all the major positions of power from which he could derive the authority to orchestrate this recovery. Again, you could go back to CHP episodes 67 and 68 to review how Deng did it, and what happened immediately after his return at the 11th Congress in August 1977, and then at the third plenum in December 18th to 22nd, 1978, when Hua Guofeng was gently pushed aside and faded from the limelight. And with Hua Guofeng being shoved gently aside, any hopes Mao had that his legacy would go down in history as he wished went out the door. It was at this most historic third plenum of the 11th Central Committee, December 78, that the reform era began in China. The path that China followed that ultimately led to where we are today began at the end of 1978, 
two years after Mao's death and the fall of the Gang of Four. Deng Xiaoping did three things that served as the epilogue to the Cultural Revolution. First order of business was to rehabilitate all those who had been unjustly booted out of their positions of power and unjustly imprisoned. This included posthumously bringing back those who had been persecuted to death. Victims who had been unjustly treated as a result of the Cultural Revolution were rehabilitated and most restored to their former positions. This is also where Deng creates the Central Advisory Commission, where those elders of his generation are placed so that room could be made for the next generation of trained technocrats to get into place. The CAC was an advisory group without that much power, but they still packed a punch. And later on, Chen Yun used his position in this CAC, Central Advisory Commission, to dig his heels in the ground and slow Deng's reforms. But this is all included in the Deng Xiaoping overview. At the fifth plenum in February 1980, Liu Shaoqi was dealt with, and though he had been dead for more than 10 years, China's former state president and revolutionary hero, going back to the beginning, was exonerated. I'm sure this was little compensation for his widow, Wang Guangmei. The investigation into Liu's case concluded Liu's arrest and later persecution was, quote, the biggest frame-up the CCP has ever known in its history, which had been created out of thin air by fabricating materials, forging evidence, extorting confessions, and withholding testimony. The next order of business to bury these ghosts of the Cultural Revolution was to put the Gang of Four on trial and use them as the scapegoat for more or less every single abuse that went on between 1966 and 1976, this entertaining and dramatic show trial took place over three months, between November 1980 and January 1981. Good old Peng Chen, remember him? It all began with his demise back in 1966. Well, he was back and intimately involved in the trial of the gang. Chang Chunqiao remained silent throughout the entirety of the trial, and the condemnation of his actions were loud and for his role during the ten years of chaos, he was severely rebuked. He received a sentence of death that was later commuted to life in prison. In 1998, Zhang was released from prison on medical parole and died of cancer in 2005 at the ripe old age of 88. Wang Hongwen, who had come from such humble beginnings as a textile factory worker and in record time rose to the very topmost heights of power in Beijing, he, too, got life in prison and died of liver disease in 1992 at the age of 58. Yao Wenyuan, who was called upon by Mao all those years ago to write the criticism of that play, Hai Rei, dismissed from office, he got off the lightest with a 20-year sentence and was released in 1996 and died of complications related to diabetes in December 2005. He lived out his days in obscurity, and his passing was... Hardly noticed. As for Madame Mao, her behavior at the trial was legendary. She refused to repent and famously talked back and argued and was totally uncooperative from the get-go. She knew, being Mao's widow and all, that no one would dare sentence her to death, which is what they did, of course, but like Zhang Chunqiao, her sentence was commuted to life in prison. And that's where she died, in prison, or more precisely, in a prison hospital where... Once she had the chance, she hung herself on May 14, 1991. She had been suffering from throat cancer and had been holed up in China's most notorious prison, Qingcheng Jianyu. The Chinese nation was glued to their TV sets for the show trial of the Gang of Four. At the trial, it was mentioned that 727,420 people had been persecuted due to the policies the gang espoused during the Cultural Revolution. Although it was little compensation, Wang Guangmei was present at the trial and watched as the death of her husband in particular was pinned on them. In addition to all her other crimes, the court also accused Jiang Qing of the systematic persecution of countless Chinese artists of all kinds. After all, in the 
realm of culture, Mao had granted Jiang Qing ultimate authority. For all the years of the Cultural Revolution, Jiang Qing was the ultimate arbiter as far as what was art and what could and couldn't be seen and enjoyed by the masses. The particular suffering of those Chinese painters, poets, writers, filmmakers, and other artists is well known. Also well known how Jiang Qing personally got involved to ruin the lives and livelihood of so many. The stories that have been passed down to us today by survivors and children of survivors are riveting and really give a good sense of the horror these people went through. Jiang Qing's strategy was predictable. Whatever heinous crime they tried to pin on her, she just said, hey, don't look at me. The signature quote from the trial was when Jiang Qing said, I was the chairman's dog. I bit whomever he asked me to bite. Well, Mao wasn't around to defend himself, and this was a hard thing to defend, as you can imagine, because there was obviously an element of truth to it. Besides the Gang of Four, there was still Chen Bo Da to deal with. He was as guilty as the next guy as far as instigating, aiding, and abetting all the worst excesses of the Cultural Revolution. Remember, due to backing the wrong horse, Chen Bo Da was already in prison since the Lushan Plenum when the trial of the Gang of Four took place. He was given an 18-year sentence and got out of prison in October 1988 and died 11 months later. This trial didn't leave out Lin Biao and his gang. The main event was the Gang of Four, but those who were Lin's closest followers, they too had judgment passed on them. And plenty of blame got heaped on the Lin Biao clique. Most notorious, of course, Air Force Commander Wu Fa-Xian. Wu and three others were given 16 to 17 years, and more than anything else, their principal crime lay in the mistreatment of political rivals in the military. So you had the rehabilitations, the trial of the Gang of Four, and the last order of business for Deng was for a final decision to be made on the Cultural Revolution from the party center. On the eve of the 60th anniversary of the founding of the CCP, on July 1st, 1981, the party center issued a document adopted by the 6th plenum of the 11th Central Committee. It was called Resolution on Certain Questions in the History of Our Party Since the Founding of the People's Republic of China. This was an attempt by the party to write the history of the CCP since liberation in 1949. In this document lie the official Communist Party verdict on the Cultural Revolution. Mao's achievement as a revolutionary in the 20s, 30s, and 40s and his contributions to Mao Zedong thought formed the whole bedrock of the legitimacy of the CCP. So the chances that the party was going to dump on the chairman were slim and nil. Nonetheless, judgment was passed, and this is what they said. Quote, the cultural revolution, and in the document, cultural revolution is always shown in quotation marks, the Cultural Revolution, which lasted from May 1966 to October 1976, was responsible for the most severe setback and the heaviest losses suffered by the party, the state, and the people since the founding of the People's Republic. It was initiated and led by Comrade Mao Zedong. But, you know, fingers weren't pointed at Mao alone. The document also said, quote, as for Lin Biao, Jiang Qing, and others who were placed in important positions by Comrade Mao Zedong, the matter is of an entirely different nature. They rigged up two counter-revolutionary cliques in an attempt to seize supreme power and, taking advantage of Comrade Mao Zedong's errors, committed many crimes behind his back, bringing disaster to the country and the people. Also, quote, the Cultural Revolution negated many of the correct principles, policies, and achievements of the 17 years after the founding of the People's Republic. In fact, it negated much of the work of the Central Committee of the Party and the People's Government, including Comrade Mao Zedong's own contribution. It negated the arduous struggles the entire people had conducted in socialist construction. 
And as far as Liu Shaoqi's persecution, the documents said, quote, the so-called bourgeois headquarters inside the party, headed by Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping, simply did not exist. Irrefutable facts have proved that labeling comrade Liu Shaoqi a, quote, renegade, hidden traitor, and scab was nothing but a frame-up by Lin Biao, Jiang Qing, and their followers. The political conclusion concerning comrade Liu Shaoqi, drawn by the 12th plenary session of the 8th Central Committee of the Party, and the disciplinary measures it meted out to him, were both utterly wrong. The criticism of the so-called reactionary academic authorities in the Cultural Revolution, during which many capable and accomplished intellectuals were attacked and persecuted, also badly muddled up the distinction between the people and the enemy. As for the perpetrators and those most guilty, the document minces no words when it says, quote, Lin Biao, Jiang Qing, Kang Sheng, Zhang Chunqiao, and others, acting chiefly in the name of the Cultural Revolution Group, exploited the situation to incite people to overthrow everything and wage full-scale civil war. The Ninth Congress of the Party in April 1969 legitimized the erroneous theories and practices of the Cultural Revolution, and so reinforced the positions of Lin Biao, Jiang Qing, Kang Sheng, and others in the Central Committee of the Party. The guidelines of the Ninth Congress were wrong, ideologically, politically, and organizationally. That was pretty straightforward and to the point. Then the document went on to say, the 10th Congress of the party perpetrated the left errors of the 9th Congress and made Wang Hongwen a vice chairman of the party. Jiang Qing, Zhang Chunqiao, Yao Wenyuan, and Wang Hongwen formed a gang of four inside the political bureau of the Central Committee, thus strengthening the influence of the counter-revolutionary Jiang Qing clique. In the huge, bold-type exclamation point to this epilogue of the Cultural Revolution said plainly, quote, Chief responsibility for the grave left error of the Cultural Revolution, an error comprehensive in magnitude and protracted in duration, does indeed lie with Comrade Mao Zedong. However, the document was also generous to Mao in stating the positive role he played, despite his later errors. It said, quote, While persisting in the comprehensive error of the Cultural Revolution, he checked and rectified some of its specific mistakes, protected some leading party cadres and non-party public figures, and enabled some leading cadres to return to important leading posts. He led the struggle to smash the counter-revolutionary Lin Biao clique. He made major criticisms and exposures of Jiang Qing, Zhang Chunqiao, and others, frustrating their sinister ambition to seize supreme leadership. All this was crucial to the subsequent and relatively painless overthrow of the Gang of Four by our party. In his later years, he still remained alert to safeguarding the security of our country, stood up to the pressure of the social imperialists, pursued a correct foreign policy, firmly supported the just struggles of all peoples, outlined the correct strategy of the three worlds, and advanced the important principle that China would never seek hegemony. It also said, quote, Comrade Mao Zedong was a great Marxist and a great proletarian revolutionary strategist and theorist. It is true that he made gross mistakes during the Cultural Revolution, but if we judge his activities as a whole, his contributions to the Chinese Revolution far outweigh his mistakes. His merits are primary and his errors secondary. He rendered indelible meritorious service in founding and building up our party and the Chinese People's Liberation Army, in winning victory for the cause of liberation of the Chinese people, in founding the People's Republic of China, and in advancing our socialist cause. He made major contributions to the liberation of the oppressed nations of the world and to the progress of mankind. So, with this document, this resolution on certain questions in the history of our party, it sought to show for all to see the official party line on not only the Cultural Revolution, but Mao's hand in allowing what happened to happen. Jiang Qing and the Gang of Four, the 
CCRG and everyone associated with Lin Biao received the overwhelming blame. While pinning the whole mess on Mao, the chairman's errors are mitigated substantially by his achievements and contributions not only to the party as well as to the Chinese nation. And to this day, this is the official party line and pretty much, you know, what I hear most Chinese say. He was bad overall, but did good things that cannot be denied. Although this is the party's official remarks on the subject of the Cultural Revolution, there are many more ways to look at this. These 10 years of chaos affected different people in different ways. There was more to it than the ruination of people's lives, the death and terrible suffering of millions of ordinary Chinese. Like every political and social issue, whatever it was, everything depended on one's ranking in society, the place they found themselves, whether a common laborer making the minimum income, or the wealthiest, best connected, and brightest shining star. Who you were and what your outlook was on life shaped your opinions of the Cultural Revolution. Back in May, uh, one of my listeners, Godfrey, writing from the lush and beautiful countryside of northern Thailand, wrote to me and said, uh, let me quote, The history of the Cultural Revolution, like all histories, is written by the victors, in this case, the administrative elite of China. Their observations are backed up by international administrative elites, who have more in common with each other than with the people they administer, who were equally horrified by the Cultural Revolution's goal of overthrowing the elite and implementing direct democracy. Mao had seen his revolution betrayed by CCP administrators who had simply assumed the roles of their local pre-revolutionary predecessors in oppressing the people. Mao intended the Cultural Revolution to be a kind of democratic great leap forward, and to a remarkable degree it succeeded. I'm quoting uh, Godfrey directly since I couldn't have said this any better myself. Godfrey recommended a book that gives a different viewpoint about the policies of the Cultural Revolution called The Unknown Cultural Revolution, Life and Change in a Chinese Village. This was written by a Chinese author who gave first-hand experience and uses a village in rural Shandong as his example. The author, uh, Han Dongping, shows that despite all the marquee events that went on in Beijing, Shanghai, Wuhan, Nanjing, and other major cities, out in parts of the countryside, there were quite dramatic improvements to the daily life of the peasants. In this book, Warren Wilson College history and political science professor Han Dongping maintains the Cultural Revolution helped overthrow local hierarchies, establish participatory democracy, and economic planning in the communes, and expand education and public services, especially for the elderly. So if you're a poor peasant living out in the countryside, maybe you might take a different approach to judging the Cultural Revolution than some you know, educated Beijing resident. Well... I hope you enjoyed this little eight-part overview on the Cultural Revolution. This is a subject that is mammoth in its size and scope. I don't know how many books and important papers have been written about this subject. It has spawned novels, movies, and is expressed in almost every conceivable kind of art form. When I call this eight-part series an overview, please know that's all it is. If you wish to learn more about this subject, there's plenty out there that can explain things better than I ever could, and certainly in much greater and fascinating detail. If there's one book above all else that I would recommend on the subject, may I suggest Mao's Last Revolution by Roderick McFarquhar and Michael Shannels, published by Harvard University Press in 2008. That was my main stalwart for this series, and I heartily recommend it. Next time we're back to the same o same o. I'll dig into my overflowing treasure trove of topics and pull one out. This is my 90th episode, so more and more you're going to hear me reference past China history podcasts that you could go back and re-listen to rather than having me keep repeating myself about some things. On my website, I'll have the usual vocabulary list for the names, places, and bits of Mandarin here and there for those of you who sent me emails requesting that. 
You got it, baby. I also have links to McFarquhar and Shanel's book, as well as a link to the recent This American Life, which has New Yorker writer Evan Osnos introducing American Kaiser Guo and his life experience in China as an American. The other story is told by Michael Meyer, another American living up in the sticks of Manchuria. He tells an amazing story and gives another point of view about you know, what it's like living in rural China. Two amazing stories. I really admire these people from all over the world who end up in China, live there for years, learn to speak perfect Mandarin, and plug themselves in to Chinese society to observe and learn and to report. So go check out um, the recent This American Life episode for two perfect examples of what I'm talking about. So that's that. For everyone out there who has been requesting this topic going back to 2010, I hope you left feeling satisfied and nourished, but hopefully you'll come back wanting more. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Claremont, California on a gorgeous, hot, sunny day. Join us next time, won't you, for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.